Okay, good day everyone. Apologies for the slight delay for this session. So once again, my name is Sonia Maudese and uh, this is one of the episodes of the Blaze Life Connected Construction Series. And today we'll be talking about architectural and construction practice in Nigeria in comparison to the practice in the United States of America. So today I have in the house Edes Asmao Ikuria, who is an emerging architect and assistant project manager that is practicing in Texas, United States of America. So Edes holds both bachelor's and master's degree in architecture from Mogofumi Aulo University, Ilefe, and she also holds a master's in construction management from the University of Houston in Texas. So after that as well, she has taken some degree seeking graduate courses in architectural history from the University of South Florida and also professional practice of architecture in the United States from the University of Houston. So Edis has about four and a half years of professional practice experience and construction as well in the United States, working in design, build, architectural, mechanical, plumbing, electrical, engineering, designs, and project management as well. So these are afforded Edis some experience with some international building code additions and the path to architectural licensure in the United States. So to her credit as well, she has some portfolio of designs and built projects within the United States and in Nigeria as well. And beside all that, she has also written some publications and peer reviewed journals. So Edis, how are you doing today? It's great to have you in the house today. I'm fine, thank you. It's good to it's good to be here. Okay, so I guess because of time, we'll just dive into it. So today we'll be comparing the practice of architecture in Nigeria with that in the United States. You have experience in both places. So as a young professional in the field of architecture with experience in both Nigeria and the US, what has been a major difference between your experience in both places? Okay. Um, the, the, a major difference between both um, practices is the standardization in both practices. So um, over here, there's also a very high level of involvement um, from practitioners and, you know, up from student level to, you know, practicing. And the AI is very respected, the American Institute of Architects. They have um, they are a common reference point by organizations for anything. So for instance, if um, a contractor, a builder, or a client is trying to get a loan from a bank to build, there are very high chances that some of these banks may insist that if the contract between the client and the contractor he wants to use to build, is not done using the AIA standard document for such a contract that they cannot give that client the loan to build. So this is what I'm saying about standardization that they are, they are a common reference point. Some government entities will not get into a contract with an architect if they are not using the AIA standardized document for that. And these are things that I'll probably show um, later in the conversation as examples. So these are the things I've noticed that it's a very strong reference point for everything um, that architectural practice has to do. And they they um, go a very long way to protect the profession over here from abuse. So um, that's something that I've seen very strongly. Um, another unique thing is that the practice is individualized in each state. So there are like 50 states in America and the um, practice is, is unique to each state. It's like a true federation, if I should put it that way. So while we have a generic license in Nigeria, when you're licensed by ACON or NIA, your, your seal, you can use it in Adamawa State and use it in Lagos to practice the nature of the size of our country and everything. But here, if you are licensed, you are licensed in the state of Texas, doesn't mean that you're licensed in the state of New York, right? So the oh, okay. license is different, right? So yeah, so there are um, exams you can take for reciprocity between practicing in various states, but the state standard is different, you know? So that's that's one unique thing about it. 
Okay, thanks a lot for that clarification. But uh, um, also another aspect I also also put some spotlight on is how is it like you know going from the educational level, like going to the university level, to you know coming out to practice. What's the support system like? What's the experience like? You know, having also done some of your studies in the USA. Well, um, I would say on the average, the support system is high i mean compared to what my experience was uh, you find that just like we have in ni we have their student memberships there's associate membership and all of that and it goes on and on so you find that there's a student chapter in a campus and it's very active right they are liaising between the chapter of that city for instance we have aia houston right so they okay. might be like in Dallas. And these are all cities in one state, right? So you see, it's not even just AIA Texas, but there's AIA Houston and there's AIA some other cities and all these cities are in one state. So you find that, okay, in the college and university, there might be a representative from the students, you know, um, in that school and in that university and they liaise strongly with the main body to bring in maybe um, activities, uh, career fairs, you know, so that students can get internships and all of that. So there's that presence, you know, there are certain things that you can get discounted if you have a um, membership, you know, with the, with the body. So th that, that awareness that there is an architectural body, you're already aware of it from university and it starts to like feed you in if you're interested in being that way some people are not really crazy about membership of organizations and that's fine some people have their criticisms politics and all that that happens it's you know it's normal but on the average there's that sense of there is a body that you can belong to right so yeah okay okay so based on this comparison now it's obvious there's a better support system in place in the u.s when compared to nigeria so uh, based on your experience in nigeria what role do you think the higher education institutions in nigeria can play to you know support young professionals to become more i know part of the system and eventually become registered members of the profession down the line well um that's a very good question i would say you know um there's this sense that i'm not i'm not going to say everything about us is i mean we're a younger body and we are just covering 36 states while over here is 50 states of which 10 of those states can be the whole of nigeria already right so <laughs> it's not exactly yeah. a fair comparison and you know okay. yeah and then the, the practice is a bit the practices are different so what I, I know that right now we're improving but you know the, the, the narrative has to change from you you hear of NIA when it's time for accreditation, right? That's when you, you know everybody is on their feet and all that. There has to be that feeling of um, this is our big daddy, and you know this is this is a um, this is an organization that can provide mentoring already. We can have boot camps. They can have architectural boot camps. They can have um, some competitions or volunteer events that you want students to participate. There's that give and take, you know, or they start as a mediator while we are in school that before you graduate, you, you can get mentorship because the NIA in that city or that state is very active with the practices and offices. And so students that are in the NIH uh, student chapter have like uh, access to firms that they can do internships with before they even graduate. So I would say that the NIA has to like, the committees they have for the educational sector have to go further in um, going into the grassroots. That's what I would say. And I think that that would help. Um, I also think that NIA should find a way to make the studies discounted. In, in, for instance, you know, if there's a way they can get into partnerships with Blaze, for instance, or, or Chrono Studios, uh, or or if, even as far as Autodex, so that you can get a student version of a software. You can get LinkedIn Learning at a discounted or almost free price so that you can learn how to use Revit, how to use Grasshopper for free, just because 
you are an NIA student member, right? So that's the extent to which they should be doing, going to, to get into, penetrate into schools. And then people will feel like, okay, when I graduate, I want to be an associate member of the NIA. I want to be, do you understand what I'm saying? That, that yeah, definitely. Them a feeling like, okay, yeah, this is a place I'd like to be. So. Um, yeah, that is quite, that's very, very valid because when you look at, you know, when students graduate from school and they come out, a lot of time feel like they are not really fully prepared for the practice outside of the yeah. education system. So it's very important, like you mentioned, for the NIA to begin to, you know, complement the the traditional education. Let me just use that term. You know, the conventional education they receive from school to also compare, com um, complement it with the kind of requirements that is needed of them when they begin to practice. Like you mentioned, things like IT skills or you know, software proficiency, and all those stuffs. Of course, I'm sure that you know there are a lot of training too that is ongoing now. I know that NIA they have this town hall series and all that, but a lot of time is mostly when people are outside of school and you know going into the schools when the students are still in school. We also go a long way. And on our own part, actually, we have quite a number of programs. At the moment, we have this uh, uh, student academic program that we're also doing, both on the part of BIM Africa and also on the part of Bliss, and um, all those activities that are tailored towards you know prepping students while they are still in school. So yeah. I guess we'll still talk, I guess we'll still talk more on that later. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about on that, yeah. Yeah, okay, so when students are not out of school, now let's even talk about, you know, the, the professional practice or even the for the younger profession. So when you look at the industry currently, you see that there is currently, apparently a drain of young creative talents from the architectural profession in recent years. You know, a lot of professionals these days, see people digressing into things like, content creation or even IT sector because perhaps it's more attractive or it's more lucrative for whatever reason. So what role do you think that membership and regulatory bodies can play to make the practice more inviting to the young ones? You know, it, with the way it's going, it's, I mean, in 10 years time, there could be virtually a drain of minds from the, both the industry and even the country. So it's quite concerning. So what role do you think the industry and regulatory body can, can do to cope you know, to reduce that? Uh, well, first of all, the drain, I would say, is cut, at, is cut across all the many industries, right? So you have okay. um, the economic situation deter is, determines how people thrive. So you find, you, we already find people drifting from careers. But I always say that the, the average architect, right, uh, six out of 10 architects, is usually multi-talented, multifaceted. So if whatever they delve into still has to do with creativity or IT, it will find that they've always had a niche for it, right? However, one of the things that the NIA can do is what I'm talking about from student membership. What is the point of being a student member? Is it because you know that by the time you want to write your final exams, they, are, they will say, you have to pay some dues and so you want to start paying it on time so that it won't co accumulate or because you know there's um, a pathway that you can see the vision of the point of your industry right even up till now the, a lot of people that are in the nia I, I know it has really improved this past three years you know but a lot of people are there because they need to get the sale they so when they hear nia stuff it's like you know, there's this, you know, that hesitation, like there isn't that, it's not fully um, incorporated. And some states have it more active. You know, Lagos and NIA have, um, Lagos and Abuja have strong NIA um, involvement, but what's happening in, you know, you know, I don't have to call certain <laughs> states, right? Yeah, so, definitely yeah, understand. So, those things they affect and i think it's time that they go back and start from school because it might be hard to catch those already practicing who are thinking of how to get money you know then the second thing they can do is standardization let the industry be respected okay you see how certain things can happen in the medical profession because there's a very strong body there right so we can the, the ni can start to liaise with the politicians unfortunately yes you have to liaise with politicians to pass the bills that protect the practice okay you have to liaise with the government of that state 
it, it's just about having conversations and bringing value and telling you um, the governor that, or Ministry of Lands and so forth, whatnot, like, look, we, we can do this for the state at a discount, but we we'll need you to put X and Y in place so that when people send drawings for approvals, it is not stamped by just anybody. Our drawings are not sold because we've already seen some malpractice happening. Um, this, 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 that. So that there's standardization also of how people are um, compensated for doing architectural work. You cannot do it. Say, there are firms today, no offense, I know there are small firms, but there are some amounts that you should not hear that <laughs> architects who has gone to school for seven years plus strike is still earning after NYSC, right? These are things, and it's not because, sometimes it's not even about the economy, it's just because there's availability of exploitation, right? So when you see the NIA standing in the gap and doing those kinds of things, standardization of the practice, you know, like here, there's room for everybody. Sorry if I'm taking too long to answer this question. There's, no, there are people who, who are going to be doing very high end designs, doing, um, you know, corporate structures and whatnot. There are people who specialize in educational facilities. There are people who just do interior build outs. You, you rent a store or a space in a shopping mall. It has to get permitted sincerely. Otherwise, the city inspector can give you a red tag. Yeah, it's not really like that. Like sometimes you can just build a small thing. Even sometimes a resident having an outdoor patio might need to get a permit from that residential, um, from that community, or even what they call the um, homeowners association. And the, the homeowners association may tell you that if this patio design is not stamped by a structural engineer or an architect, we will not approve it. So, do you, so you can see that there is actually room for someone who is just going to draft in three hours an outdoor patio for him to make some money because they will not accept drawings that is not stamped. And even if you're not the registered architect, you can do the drawing and give it to a registered architect to mentor you and stamp it. But you see the standardization, it's already entrenched into the local governments so that at almost all levels, the the the, uh, yeah, the 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 profession has relevance, so I think that will help when people start to feel like they they are being architects is relevant. It's not just to produce three Ds or to just draft on ending. Like being an architect has strong relevance. So I think that will reduce the um, the brain drain. Yeah. So apparently there's there's less room for you know infiltration of you know things like quackery and all that as well in the profession because. In today is as if, for example, you have people like real estate developers that can actually design and, and deliver buildings today without even involving much of, you know, the mainstream professionals, and they are able to do that and make tons of money from it and get away with it as well. Okay, yeah, yeah that's. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you have anything to contribute to that as well. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say that over here, actually, it the truth is we we are all a synergy um, situation, not in a synergy situation here an, an engineer can stamp a drawing done by an architect but he just cannot stamp certain kinds of designs right so we all took the same courses we all drafted the same software so it's all it's normal for an architect to even know how to estimate and it's normal for an engineer to be to be able to do some kind of drawings and stamp but i mean the the the, the level of um what's the word now quackery like you said is is everywhere but it's reduced. There's the fear of repercussion, right? At least. So I think those are those are little things that can improve, you know, where we are at. Okay, so one last thing I want to ask is basically to compare the, the path to becoming a licensed architect. So and I will also use an example since you are not um, you are not a US citizen, for example. So how does someone with a foreign degree become an architect in the US? I mean, how what's the what's the path like? Okay. In the US. Um, so the first thing, like when you come in, um, however you've come in, right? The first thing you want to do is um, open an NCAB record. So just like okay. we have Arcon and NIA, right? We have the licensing body and we have the, you know, so we also have AIA and NCAB. And NCAB is the examining body for instance here, right? So 
you open a um, an NCARB record. It is spelled uh, N-C-A-R-B. If you just go to ncarb.org, you'd see everything. You open an NCARB record. It's just open your account, blah, blah, blah. And then you fill in all your credentials. You got your bachelor's or whatever from here, blah, blah, blah. You fill it all in. The next thing you would need to do is send your transcripts over to the NCARB evaluating agency for review, for evaluation. That agency is called ESA, E-E-S-A. Um, probably, I can't remember the full name, something evaluating whatever agency. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so that this is a subset of the National Accredit Architectural Accreditation Board here, NAB. So what they do is they look at your um, transcript and tell you these are the remedial courses you have to take. And from my experience, no matter what you studied, where you studied, you're going to likely have to take professional practice in architecture in the US. So okay. your, yeah, so even if you have other things checked in the number of courses you're supposed to take, when you get, um, most likely they will want you to take that course because you're coming to practice here. So you need to understand how it, the profession is. Other things that may happen is if they're not convinced that you took an English uh, composition course or whatever in your bachelor's, you know, don't don't come with the expectation that everybody knows we've been going to school with with English <laughs> since, right? Just okay. just know that if it's possible for you to get your transcripts to state all courses were taken in English, um, and then if you have like in Ife, we had an elective that you must take to graduate, and it was in English. But you see, yeah. what happened for me is that elective is not graded. Like you don't, on your transcript, you don't see A, B, C or whatever. You just see pass, right? Pass, pass and it's not, Yeah, and it's not computed with the GPA, but it's compulsory. So when they see, if there's a way to put in a clause to say this sort of English course was graded or whatever, then they may not ask you to go and take some English course. And trust me, TOEFL is not going to be applicable or IELTS they would need you to go to somewhere and take maybe for a semester English composition. So that was the scenario with me that um, you can take in a regular community college. It's very, very affordable. So with each person, whatever your, your, your transcript says determines what they'll ask. You can debate, you can ask for a second, eval I mean, ask them to for an appeal. You can appeal certain things because it's expensive to actually send you the transcript. It's over $2,000. And then, you know, and then another thing is they might want you to take a course that has to do with general education, just like GST or anything. We, many of those electives we take that is general education that is civics or history or government related. Yeah, so you might need to take that. When that is done, when they've given you, when you've taken all those courses and you've sent your transcript back to them, they, then you have permission to start sitting for the licensing exam, which is in six steps. So between when you open your NCAP record and when you get all these courses taken, you can actually be working, okay? If, and that's, that has to do with your visa status, whether it's student status and you're working as intern or whatever, that has to do with, that has nothing to do with NCAP right now. That's, if you're eligible to work, you can already be working and be logging in your hours into that same NCAP record. So you don't have to say, okay, because you haven't um, taken, the courses they say you should take, then you can't. So you can be piling up hours of work while you're trying to meet all those requirements. And when you meet half the number of hours, 18,700 and, um, sorry, 1,860 hours, yes, out of 3,000 plus, when you meet 1,860, you can go and start taking the licensing exam. So that is usually the pathway. And you must, um, you must work either in an architectural firm or a related establishment like an engineering firm or a construction company. However, in an engineering firm or other scenarios, there's a limited number of hours you can work there. So I worked in other scenarios. I worked for a construction company and an engineering firm, and I can only work that half hours, 1,860 hours. So I can already start taking the licensing exams once I've reached that, you know, but I can't add more hours under that. I have to be in an architectural firm. So there's room to 
navigate. You can work in other, you know, um, environment and um, industries that are allied, and you can get your qualifications. But eventually, you want to end up directly under an architect to be able to, or a landscape architect in U.S. or Canada province to be able to get the full credits. Okay, so I guess that's quite a long journey, but it's, it's yeah, not it's, impossible. It's, it's, it's a not long impossible. Journey, but it's not impossible, and it's not that long. Yeah. Like if you work for a year and a half, you can actually meet those hours, you know. But you okay. have to start the process to be able to to get there. Um. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that clarification. Of course, it's been a great conversation. But before I start looking at, I can see a lot of comments already coming in. But before I look at the comments, I like to ask all these some random questions. Exactly. So I'll ask you two random questions before I start okay. looking at the comments. Yeah. So uh, obviously, in the US, so you must have traveled to so many places. So what's your favorite travel destination? Actually, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anywhere that has an island is a travel destination. Uh, favorite. So. Anywhere that has an island, anywhere that it's nature, is so anywhere in the Caribbean or so where. Uh, okay. If, if it has so, an island, I'm going to go there. Okay, that's great. That's great. So the second question I have is, what's your favorite fashion brand? I know that you also into some <laughs> form of entertainment and stuff like that. So what's your favorite fashion uh, brand? I don't have one actually. <laughs> I don't. Uh, okay. I have different that I like, but. I would, I would go with a Tommy Hilfiger any day, but yeah, that's oh. so okay. All right, so thanks a lot for all the you know. It's been a lot, a lot of great insights from the conversation so far. So at this point, I will start looking at some of the comments and perhaps questions. So if you also have any question. Fortunately, we are not able to broadcast to Facebook today, but most people here are from LinkedIn actually. So if you have any question to ask. Feel free to drop it into the comment section. Although we started late, but at least we still have a couple of minutes. So I'll try to attend to the ones I have here already. So uh, this is not a question. This is not a question. So I think I'll just okay. Hassan and if we should say support systems are totally different. Yes, okay. So Hassan obviously is also in the US, so I'm sure that he has his own share of experience as well. So, um, I don't know what this one is. Uh. Okay. So, Hassan also said, this is the way the education committee for NIA needs to do lots more education and enlightenment. Yeah, I guess this is a, this is a contribution. Yeah, so obviously, and this actually needs to start early enough. I mean, yeah, from enough. the moment, yeah, from the moment you become a student, you, you need to feel like you are part of something. And you can okay. see your tra your trajectory to becoming a certified member of the yeah so that is obviously true and then Ak, Ade, uh, elijah mentioned i think we need to differentiate the current roles of nia and Akon. currently Akon is liaising with the government and politicians to get some bills passed and also regular regularizing some codes for architects yet it is still a far cry but a step has been taken Okay, yeah, so that's great to hear. I guess that's also a contribution yeah. as well. I'd like to yeah, share so it, some of those documents at some point, just to give an example of standard okay. that I talked about. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll share them in a bit. So, Gloria mentioned, absolutely. Um, okay, Diolu La Luoye said, often the roles and duties of the regulatory body are gone and a social organization, an organization body, NIA, are not clearly defined. And that's a major problem on that one of architectural practice. That's the problem number one of architectural practice in Nigeria. Yeah, of course, I guess in recent years, they've been trying to, you know, define what exactly NIA is supposed to do and what ACON is supposed to do. So I guess there's also some improvements in that regard as well. And then, a day Elijah also mentioned true, but it's a bit clearer than it was. Than it was, and both are taking up their roles the way it should be from point of view. So I guess you are replying to Diolu on that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I guess you guys are yeah, it does, but I mean I think right now it's getting better. Okay, someone is someone is actually asking answering for you. You said that your favorite fashion brand is <laughs> 
It's plenty, but yeah, I see you. <laughs> okay, so um, sadly, but we hope for the sake of the practice for clarity to be attached. Okay, I guess that's between an eye and an apple. Yeah, similarly, actually, here AIA is the governing body, but they have given and NCAP is the um examining body. And when you get your license, it is um kind of you carry the AIA title, however. You can take one more exam that is also done by NCAP that allows you to practice in some other states, and then you now bear the NCAP title. So, like I said, there, there's less of conflict here, but and there's more of synergy. And you can even see, like I said, there is another agency under them that does evaluation of transcripts. And then there is the bigger organization that is in charge of accreditation. And all of them are subsets, like they all have. So I think, you know, that's really the direction that we should be going. Okay. Now someone asked a question. They say, Edis, how challenging have the units of measurement been in pure metric system? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, when I came, I didn't feel the I didn't feel it that much. I mean, um, you know, even though we draw in the metric system. The parlance used by the look, the workmen is actually imperial. So you you don't you don't usually hear a carpet and say, oh, I want fifty by fifty, um, you know, a plank. You hear two by two. You understand, oh, okay. <laughs> right? So I already knew the basic standard. Like, okay, one feet is three hundred mm. One feet is also twelve inches. So I just do the mental math and I adapted with time. However, when it comes to fractional inches, which is also used here. Ah, that one, I don't, <laughs> I don't, when it starts to five over seven or five over eight of an inch, uh -uh. I just, in my mind, I've approximated it to one inch and I go ahead. But it's not, it's not, it's not as scary as it sounds. I know we rev it. All you have to do is just go to uh, parameters and project units and your joints will just switch to Imperial automatically. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. Okay, so I also have a question here from Christopher Iwebu. Let me say, what's the interface like between architects and contractors? What's the most used contract method? So I believe okay. in Nigeria, for reference in Nigeria, most of the contracts here is design bid built. So perhaps it's trying to compare it with what you have in the US. Yes, it's also, um, you know, this would be a good time to share one of the documents. Um, let me see which one it would be. I think that will be AIA um 101 you can share ai 101 yeah ai 101 ai 101 and eight and two and a 201 so it's it, okay. it you have design bid build that is very common it's still it's still very a 101 common. right yeah 101 and then 201 it's still very common uh, here okay. right and then th there's design build so and then there is the integrated um, development approach integrated program approach so those are the three but um it's still design bid built to a very large extent and sometimes the integrated approach means that the uh, contractor who is going to build it is already brought in at maybe design development stage with the architect so even if he's not part of schematics he becomes part of design development stage so he's already telling them this thing is not going to work because the client has gone through an integrated approach to bring in, you know, both both fields. So he can already tell them, you're doing this thing in drawing, but in practical, this material is better and they will change the specification already. So you can, we, we have a little bit of that, especially sometimes when... Sorry, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and especially sometimes when it's already, um, you know. So the three the three are used very, very commonly. Design, build, build for the same reason, cost. Some people can't get you to build already as they are designing, so they have to like scout. Design, build, most times the con is very, also, it's very common. You have big construction companies who hire architectural firms to do their design, they design for a project while they build. There's also what we call construction manager at risk. That is also done by mostly, con um, con um, you know, uh, con construction companies where they put a cap at the amount that 
that project is going to cost design and otherwise and if it goes beyond that is the liability so it's they are all used yeah this document is an example of one of the reasons why i say the ai is very standardized so you can see this contract is called um, an ai document 101 and there are versions of it but this is just an example it's a standardized form of agreement between the owner of a project the client and a contractor so this is an example it encompasses so much that it's probably enough for you to go into a contract with any contractor then i think if you are a member you can actually purchase the editable form where you can take out some things that don't apply to you and you can add some things but um and that's another thing if you are a member you get it at a discounted price so you can you find a situation where a, a client cannot get a loan to build because they use loans a lot here banks are they are funding a lot of private projects with the hope of getting the money back but they might tell you they won't give you this loan if you are not going to use the ai document and the ai is making money from this so imagine if ni is doing something like that they've worked with the government of a state they have standard agreements you know that you can if you take someone to court for you can get your lawyer to draft your regular agreements but this can be a template or a guide they have the one for clients and contractors they have the ones for clients and architects they even have the ones for contractor and subcontractors and then if your agreement changes you understand maybe you have to amend some of the clauses there's another one that you can use for additional services or another um if you share the 201 that that one yeah this is, is this is 201 no i'm seeing 101 a101 the um the, oh okay the a201 is kind of like a generic document that has everything general conditions for contract constru and construction so many of the other sub documents like the one you saw before will reference that they'll say okay according to section blah 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 of 201 yeah, yeah this is so yeah so you see as the name implies general conditions of the contract for construction so most times whenever you're signing any of the other documents that's from there usually you are you accompany with this one as a general bible you understand that shows what different people are supposed to do generally what is expected generally you know different categories of beginning of the work end of the work blah 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 so you might find in the a101 like the one that is between owner and contractor it may tell you in a section according to xyz section of 201 which is the general information condition template so it, this this these things make the profession revered you know like ah don't mess with nia people don't mess with all these architects so you can't do anyhow do you understand the, if you sign this document you can get sued blah 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 i'm i'm not saying all uh, practices use this uh, like all situations they don't use this but there are some levels of projects where they don't want to use anything else rather than this you understand what i'm saying so yes so yeah so that's that's an example okay so thanks a lot this one is the amendments of to the professional services agreement you also have the standard form of agreement between an actor so yeah so thanks a lot for the in-depth clarifications I think I'll just go back to some of the comments I have here. And the next comment says from Victoria Ikede. She's asking how important is specializing? Do people work across roles? Like in Nigeria, where you find someone, person is project manager, is an architect, is a builder, is everything. Oh, so do people uh, work like that? Yeah. Do people work like that as well in the US? Not really. In some cases, yes, but not really. The, um, the contractor uh, or builder, in fact, it's like a separate industry, even though we are interfacing. For instance, I my my boss currently actually asked me like this. Um, you had your you just had this master's in construction management. Are you that's a separate career? Are you going to go that way, or you want to remain with architecture? So it's 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 separate industries, and even in the architecture, there are specializations. It's not like you can't. It's not like you come in there with a box that ah no. I can't do this, but you find that many firms have departments. So you you typically have residential architecture, 
and then we have commercial architecture. Everything from shopping centers, offices, blah, 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 is categorized as commercial. Everything that is not residential, even apartment complexes that people live in is sort of considered commercial, but um, it's still under what we call multifamily because it's multiple families that will live in an apartment complex. So you find some firms, all they do is residential architecture. And then we have um, K, K, K to 12, that's education, that's building of schools, high schools, blah, blah, blah. Then we have yeah. um, hospitality, hotels, everything, hospitality, restaurants, whatnot. So you can find that, then we have health. So you find that probably in a firm, there are, there are subunits that people can work in. And then if people are advertising for jobs, sometimes they specify that they are looking for a health architect coordinator. So someone who knows about hospitals and how to do that. So yeah, it's important, but I think for like personally for me in my, in my formative years, I didn't want I, to be in any category. I just wanted to like, you know, and there are different codes of design that um, inform designing these structures. So if you go to the IBC, International Building Code, which is the main reference for the US, different cities, different states can have the different versions like 2020, 2012, 2018, 2015, they may be using different ones, but they usually use the IBC. There are different codes that govern how you design a house, a hospital, you know, even fire ratings that you should use for walls in certain situations. So specialization is more here than it is back home. Yes, obviously. Uh, yeah, but, definitely. Um, but, All right, thanks. Thanks for the clarification. I also have another question here from Christopher once again. So what's your experience with drawing standardization and design output? Most times you see very terrible drawings here coming from actors. What is it like over there? Uh, I would say it depends on the level your firm is at. There's minimum requirements to get approved by the city when you submit your drawings to them, right? If you okay. meet the minimum, you will get, you know, approved. And that usually takes series of back and forth between the architects, you know. So yes, the definition of standard of drawing just varies from what level your firm is at. So medium sized small firms may be doing drawings at a certain level because the clientele cannot afford to pay for more hours of your time. Just the same way it is, right? But the question is, if you submit that drawing, will they send it back? You understand, will the city send it back? Even when you have great drawings, they will, the city will still send it back for comments. Like, you didn't do this, you should do that. But when you say quality of the drawing, I'd say that just depends on practices and um, the, 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 um, the, the city is not asking for much. If you show certain things, they will be okay. Like in terms of number of sheets, relevant sheets that they need to see. But the information in it, like how you draft, like your drafting technique is not their problem per se. Do you understand? So yeah, there are terrible drafters and everything. Yes, there are people, like I said, you may not be a registered architect. You may just be a designer and you are able to practice and do some level of drawing. So I would say it's, it's here and here. However, Revit is used by many medium to top firms as the um, you know for construction documentation. So, okay, thanks a lot for that clarification. So, I guess there's still a whole lot of improvement. Yeah, obviously, so there's still a lot of improvement needed on both sides. But yeah, I guess I guess there's a higher level of standardization over there than you have in this part of the world. Anyway, okay. So the next one I say, okay. This is just a comment. And then, so this is asking from Precious to them. I say, what's the process for graduate architect who wants to switch to construction management? Um, there is not like a formal process. It's just about if you, there are certifications due. There's the CMIT, construction management, construction manager in training. You can take those, but um, the thing is to switch means you have to switch employment. So if, you get an employer who is a builder or a construction company and they are willing to take you in, then you've already started the career. It's not like a construction manager cannot easily become an architect because you have to get that license, right? I mean, you get what I mean? 
But an yes. architect can become a construction manager if he can get the employment in that position or to get some experience to show that oh, he can. You can start from assistant construction manager and become, you know. However, you can take some certifications as well. The CMIT is one of them. Um, so construction manager in training, and then there's the one construction manager professional or something. Yeah. So there's no like, oh, you have to do this. No, I, in my opinion. Yeah. So that's it. Okay. Someone is wishing us good night. So I'll say amazing showcase in this. Okay. Thank you. Um, this from Sarah Cross Kika. I say, I have a question. When can you suggest between AutoCAD and Revit for architectural work? I guess you're trying to compare architecture, um, AutoCAD and Revit. Well, uh, I think I'll, ju I'll just finish a bit on that. that. <laughs> <laughs> you, it's precious. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, because I know who is asking. I know, I know that. <laughs> yeah, I know that you are self asking the question. You know the answer, but we all know that. I mean, the, the industry is progressing away yeah. from you know just drafting to being able to create intelligent three D models. So, obviously. There are still a lot of firms that use AutoCAD today. A whole lot, even here. Yeah. But yes, but I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sure that they're already seeing the importance for being able to create, and not just about being able to create models, but something the that to save, yeah. yeah, the gain that comes with it, being able to use that information during construction and all the way to operations and maintenance of facilities. Yeah, so, post-occupancy as well, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. So this is from Gloria. She's asking, are there developers that go against the building regulation in America? And if yes, what are the consequences? Yes, there are. You, if if the city inspector passes through your property, he'll put a ticket there. You have to respond. So, if you don't respond, the big man's gonna come for you. Simple, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. So, I mean, of course, what I mean is, so so sometimes some people, it's still the same thing here. It's the same thing everywhere, really. It's just how checks are put so some people maybe because of lack of information they rent a store and they're already partitioning oh this one will be the office this one will be the storage they just rent the store city inspector passes gives you a red tag where's the permit because you probably have to like frame it or put it on the door so that on if you had it but you don't have it so they'll put a red tag and they'll keep coming maybe every two weeks or every month and that time that's when people you see them running out as getter ah architect ah help or they put ticket on my door because they can close that place off and you might even end up in court you might have to end you know respond so so definitely it's some people get away with it because maybe the city inspector doesn't come to that side so they built without a permit they are quick to go and hire the builder and that orientation is a problem in both our countries right so it's it's, it's yes there are repercussions um yeah okay so of course, we already run out of time, but I think we've gone to most of the questions. I think I, I'll just attend to one last question here. And this question is from Shamba Kanviete. I hope it's well pronounced. But he's asking, how should we use the USA experience for our reality? So I guess what do we learn from comparing both uh, context? Okay, well, um, everything about here is not perfect, you know, and I'm even still learning the process. I think, like I've said, maybe um, if we can, if they can advance in, um, you know, getting involvement from the early stages, if they can advance, everybody will be interested when they see that this body is fighting for them. If it's possible for um, NIA to have a relationship with Autodesk, for instance, so that students, when they go into the Autodesk web website and they search for um, AutoCAD or Revit for students and educators, and there's a drop down where you can put in your school, right? So if you just, all you need to do is put in your school, put in your email, Autodesk will email you the uh, student version, um, you know, wherever you can install it in your system. Imagine if you do that and you put the drop down and you see your school in Nigeria. Those are those are things that we can do. And then the regulation, like from government and local government bodies, about building, you know, they, ours is not bad. There are still things that we can learn. I don't, I don't really always like to feel like, oh, we're trying to make it look like these people are hundred percent, you know, we are nothing. No, yeah, we are evolving and we are getting there. And one beauty about us is that you can be a light, an architect in Abuja and work in Port Harcourt, right? Here, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Yeah, you can probably work, but you can't seal the drawing. 
you understand, until you take maybe some exams. So you can see there is some things about us that might be more um, favorable to someone practicing in Nigeria than even working than over here. Yeah, but I would say it's the regulation of the industry so that there's respect for the profession. I think that's what we can adapt to. Yeah. Okay, just to buttress a bit about the issue of the students, I think I also just chip in a bit about what we do at Blaze as well, because recently we also became an Autodesk Academic Partner. Also, BIM Africa is also an Autodesk Academic <laughs> in Africa, there's an autodesk academic partner. So we've been planning on reaching out to we already in talks with a quite a number of schools. So I think I'll just share my screen a bit just to show that. Um, because great. so recently this is our online platform where we create online courses. So recently we set up this special package for students whereby you know we create or demand courses around all these courses um revit most of these it skills basically is the long term is not just limited to the construction sector really it's basically preparing students with it i mean equipping them with it skills that they will need when they come out of school and for as little as 20 dollars for a whole year students will be able to access all the courses that we have on the platform so basically yeah so and with that as well the whole issue of you know, we also plan on taking care of the student license because we, as an academic partner, we can actually liaise with Autodesk to ensure that the students have the license to, you know, use utilize all these tools that you are being trained on. So mm. the, the when you mentioned the uh, student license, I realized that, yeah, those, those are things we're already looking at. So in the coming months, we already plan on reaching out to schools. In fact, in the coming weeks, actually, we already plan on reaching out to schools to, you know, begin to engage the students but basically these are on demand courses that i have on the portal as a student once you become a registered member on the platform you have access to all the courses that you have here and even the ones we are creating over time so you can just see the sites courses.blazing.net i think i'll just drop it on the comment Please section drop as it. Well. i'm very interested actually yeah and this actually is not limited to nigeria it's, it's from any part of the world but the student package is basically the univ all the universities in africa so as long as you're able to prove your studentship, provide your student ID or something like that, you'll be enrolled into the student package. And even for professionals, professionals is not even that expensive. To, if you go to the membership here, see that for professional, as low as $9 per month and about $100 mm -hmm. in, for a whole year as a professional, you still access all the courses we have on the platform. So I just thought to mention that. Please, thank you for before. mentioning this. I didn't even know this. And I was just telling someone about you yesterday. So, so yeah. I, think, I think I will. Yeah, this is something is still very yeah. recent, actually. We are still working on it, really. but yeah, it's already launched. We just launched it some months, some, some weeks ago. Fantastic. Okay, so, yeah, so uh, these are just some comments I have here. What do you want Yeah, thank you, Abelia and um, Beam Africa. Okay, yeah, this is the Beam Africa country representative for Angola. Yeah, thanks for making our time, and then Gloria as well. So because of time, I'll just go to the comments, but I'll not be answering anymore. So according to your own experience, what do you advise to Nigerian actors? Because due to the development of digital design, more professionals stay focused to traditional way. Yeah, of course, we've already mentioned that even as professionals, we know the importance of adopting all these, all these tools and processes that I imagine. It's not as if we don't know the implications, but a lot of time people, there are a lot of, you know, in the previous session, we talked about um drivers and barriers of beam adoption in nigeria and sometimes people look at the cost implication or they don't even have trained personnel to use the tools and other stuff but of course it's something that over time they need to really make the investment before they can reap the benefits that's coming to so i'll say in terms of awareness a lot of firms know the importance of this but it's just the traditional way of doing things yeah a lot of times even, even we, here i know a firm that the principal said i don't like revit and i was looking at him like uh -uh. <laughs> your encounter with it was difficult but if you know how to use this thing you know that you will save a lot of hours on your work so yeah so a lot of time I think, you know yeah it's basically that inertia to you know embrace something new the same way when autocad came out people were still stuck with drafting with their hands but over time so i believe it's something that with time it's hard it doesn't have any choice which is also why it's important to prepare the students so that in the next 10 to 20 years, I mean, no offense, but they'll become more senior professionals in the industry and to become a normal thing for everybody. Yeah, I must add that yeah. all that I know that helped me maybe even get a job is all that I acquired in Nigeria, to be honest. AutoCAD and Revit skills and everything. 
I only let new few new things here, so we must we must head that way. Yeah, Joseph said great initiative to Blaze. Yeah, thank you. And then you also have a comment from Anthony. Say great. Yeah. So thanks everyone. And before we round up, I'll just perhaps you have one last advice to give, maybe to younger professionals or to anybody as well. You know? What's one last advice would you give? Especially people have been asking about, you know, moving to digital transformation and all that. So what advice would you give someone, you know, that is kind of yeah. lackluster or kind of reluctant to embracing all these processes? What advice would you give the person? I always say seek knowledge. Seek knowledge. Sincerely, I, I invest in knowledge a lot. I know it's sometimes expensive, but like he showed that thing. Trust me, I'm going to check it out after and I will pay for something there. Yeah. <laughs> Seek knowledge. However, if you if you do, it it just gives you an edge. There are so many ways, you know. Sometimes some people, even though abroad, might be blown by your portfolio and they want to sponsor you to come and work. So just just seek knowledge and keep adding adding to yourself. That's all I that's all I would say. Don't be comfortable. Okay, so it's been a great conversation and thanks. I mean, thank you to, for making our time to you know share your knowledge and experience with everyone today. So basically, this is what we do every two weeks. We invite someone to come and share their experience centered around you know technology and digital transformation of the built sector. So we also look forward to having you in subsequent episode. My pleasure. This. Thank you for having yes, me. So, yeah, so every two weeks, I mean, ahead of time, we always communicate to, you know, all the people that we have in our network. And every two weeks, every other Saturday, we, we have it live here on LinkedIn. We also stream to Facebook and YouTube as well. But of course, most people come through LinkedIn. So thanks to everyone, too, that have been a part of this. And you can always rewatch this. Um, you can rewatch it either on my, on my handle on LinkedIn, or you can even watch the processed version on the same courses.blazing.net. If you visit the blog page there, you see all the previous episodes and you can always watch it at your own convenience. So thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll see you some other time.